9 Creepiest Unsolved Mysteries from Michigan The mystery of Union Big Shot Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance is arguably one of the most famous in the U.S. Numerous places in Michigan and other states have been searched for his body. However, there are plenty of other compelling mysteries that have happened in the Mitten State, some of them supernatural and others just as earthly. 1. The Fatal Obsession of Lydia Thompson In Turkey shortly after the end of World War I, a British military officer named Louis Thompson met a pretty young woman named Lydia Shevchenko, a nurse who had fled her native Russia during the revolution. The two fell in love, and married in 1922. Little did they know it at the time, but this would prove to be far more disastrous to both of them than war or revolution. In 1928, the couple immigrated to the United States, settling in Orchard Lake a swanky area just outside of Detroit, Michigan. They opened a laundry, which expanded into a highly profitable chain. Louis also found success as an auto dealer. These businesses soon made them very rich and very unhappy. Although Louis relished their newfound fortune and the luxuries it could bring, Lydia was evidently one of those people for whom wealth is more of a burden than a joy. While Louis happily spent his money on the high life, Lydia continued to work in their laundry and castigate her husband for his extravagance. A deep estrangement developed between these two basically incompatible people, a fissure that widened beyond repair when Lydia found out that Louis was having an affair with his married secretary, Helen Budnick. In 1944, Louis asked his wife for a divorce. Lydia, with her old school, ultra conservative values, fiercely refused to even consider the idea. She still claimed to love her husband, and in any case, marriage, for her, was truly a case of till death do you part. Someone was to take those words far too literally. In 1945, the Thompson marriage took a shockingly ugly turn. Lydia had not only hired no less than three detective agencies to shadow her husband, she had fallen into the habit of snooping on her husband's every move herself. On March 31st, she tailed Louis to a Detroit nightclub where he was having dinner with some friends, including female friends. As it happened, the socializing was of an innocent variety, but to Lydia it had all the appearance of a Roman orgy. She stormed up to Louis' table and began hurling invective at the women. Then, she pulled a vial of acid out of her purse and threw it at them, burning their faces and legs. Unsurprisingly, this ended for good any chance of the Thompsons ever reconciling. Louis, probably harboring worries for his own skin, fled to Miami, where Helen Budnick was vacationing. Lydia was hot on his trail. She confronted the bear, telling Budnick that if the secretary did not give Louis up, I'll haunt you all my life, I'll kill myself. Lydia was, if nothing else, a woman who meant what she said. She swallowed a handful of sleeping pills, and, when those did nothing worse than make her sick, she climbed onto a ledge outside the hotel and swore she would jump. Budnick, aghast, frantically promised Lydia that she would never see Louis again. Those were mere empty words, of course. After the trio returned to Michigan, Louis and Helen took up exactly where they had left off. Louis moved out of the Thompson home. Lydia again threatened suicide, but this time, Budnick called her bluff. She flatly refused to end the affair. Lydia retorted by threatening to have Helen disfigured for life, and with her track record, that was no empty threat. She continued stalking her husband, but she confided to friends that she was becoming terrified that someone was spying on her during these outings. She began talking of her death either by her own hand, or someone else's. She bought a gun. This uneasy situation had a grim resolution on October 11, 1945. That morning, Lydia breakfasted with two female friends. The two women later said that Mrs. Thompson expressed fears that she might be murdered, but in such a vague way that they didn't take her words seriously. Around 1 p.m., Mrs. Thompson entered a grocery store where she was a regular customer. She went up to the owner, clutching a small piece of paper. She asked him, Will you look up the man whose name is on the paper? Unfortunately, the owner did not even bother to see what the name was. He merely waved her off, saying he was too busy at the moment. The frantic woman protested, but you've got to do it. I'm scared to death. I've got to know this. You've got to find this man for me. As he continued to show disinterest in her curious request, she finally gave up and left. Mrs. Thompson then went to the apartment of a friend, Harriet Steele. By this point, she was practically in hysterics, crying and saying she feared for her life. Everything that causes the trouble, she wailed, is on this slip of paper. She added that if she didn't find out who this man was, 
Maybe I will not see you tomorrow. Mrs. Steele did not see what this name was. She just tried consoling her friend as best as she could until Lydia set out again on her strange peregrinations. Later that day, Lydia sent a telegram, purportedly to her sister in Russia. The message read, send your address and mailing package soon. Why immediately? The exact meaning of this message remains a mystery. This cryptic telegram was Lydia Thompson's last known action. The following day, her car was found in a downtown parking lot in Pontiac, Michigan. It had evidently been left there sometime between 10 and 11.30 p.m. the previous night. It was unknown who had driven the car. On October 13, mushroom pickers found her body in some woods a few miles outside of Pontiac. Lydia's death had not been an easy one. She had been knocked unconscious, and then stabbed many times with both a knife and a nice pick. Then. Her murderer took a hatchet and nearly decapitated her. The doctor who performed the autopsy believed there was a lapse of four or five days between her first wounds and the death blow to her neck, adding an additional layer of strangeness to the mystery. Authorities believed she had not been killed where she was found, but the site of her death is unknown. Her home showed no sign of robbery, or a struggle of any sort. However, Lydia's gun, ration book, driver's license and keys had all disappeared. Found on her desk was a letter she had written which said, if after this day you don't see me and you don't hear anything of me, then go on Jefferson and find a man by the name of Peroni and ask him where I am. This is the doings of my husband. He is tired of me and wants to marry her. Everything that belongs to me I leave to you. The letter was addressed to her father, Andrew Shevchenko, who was living in Detroit. For whatever reason, Lydia had kept secret from everyone, including her husband. The information that Shevchenko had immigrated from Russia. Andrew told investigators that he knew nothing of the meaning of this letter, or anything else about Lydia's recent doings. Police found three men named Peroni who lived on Jefferson Avenue. However, they all denied knowing Lydia, and as far as anyone could tell, they were all being truthful. Also found in the house was Lydia's diary, which was full of her despair over her shattered marriage and sinister hints of doom. I shall drag two people into my death with me. She wrote on one page. She very nearly did. Louis, of course, became the prime suspect in her gruesome murder. A carpenter who did work for Lydia told investigators that three weeks before her death, she confided to him that Louis had attacked her with a nice pick. The man quoted her as saying, Don't be surprised if they find me in the country with a nice pick through me. However, no evidence other than this hearsay was found tying Louis to the killing. Although both Louis and Helen Budnick had alibis for the time of Lydia's death, they both remained under a dark cloud of suspicion. Two weeks after Lydia died, her father suddenly left Detroit, saying that he was going someplace where it was more pleasant, as if the story was not confusing enough already. Shortly after Shevchenko fled from view, police reportedly received a cable from a woman believed to be Lydia's sister in Russia. This message said that their father had been dead for many years. The puzzle only deepened when investigators learned that in the last months of her life, the normally tight-fisted Lydia had been spending money at an astounding rate. In her final weeks, she took well over $6,000 from her bank account and borrowed from a friend an additional $1,500. No one ever determined where all this money went. Police heard stories claiming that Lydia had been paying gang members to beat up her husband's lady friends, but even this would not account for all her expenditures. The police found no evidence these hired thugs ever carried out Lydia's orders, in February 1946, four months after Lydia's murder, Louis married Helen Budnick. She gave birth to a son that November. The newlyweds prepared to settle down in Thompson's luxurious Orchard Park house. While the house was being cleaned up, a package was found behind the refrigerator. It contained Lydia's missing keys, license, and ration book. Several months later, her gun was found behind some pipes in one of the closets. Police claim they had searched those same places immediately after Lydia's death and had found nothing. Louis told the police he was becoming increasingly convinced that Lydia had paid to have herself killed, in the hope of framing him for her murder. At other times, he declared that his estranged wife had been the victim of a sex maniac. Helen, on the other hand, asserted, Lydia was arranging to have us killed only to be murdered by her own hitman. In 1947, a Wayne County judge investigating the local organized crime racket heard some very curious things about the Thompson case. A woman named Laura Riddle said her boyfriend, Stanley Ankulowicz, an ex-con with mob ties, told her that Louis had hired him to compromise Lydia. Later, Louis offered him $10,000, to dispose of her entirely. 
Riddle added that Ankulowicz's and an unnamed Italian had also been involved in some murky plot to blackmail Mrs. Thompson. This story was enough for the judge to issue indictments against Ankulowicz's and the Thompsons. When he was arrested, Ankulowicz's claimed that he had invented the whole account, in order to scare Riddle off so he could return to his wife and three children. Whether this was the truth or not, the judge at their preliminary hearing dismissed the charges against the trio on technical grounds. There was no proof the murder took place in Wayne County. Lydia's body was found in nearby Oakland County. Thompson and his wife were released, but the police made it clear to the press that they were far from exonerated. The investigation into Lydia Thompson's murder essentially ended on that very unsatisfactory note. There has been no end of theorizing about the mystery. Was Lydia murdered by an assassin hired by her husband? By a hitman she herself had hired to murder Louis and Helen? By a hitman she herself had hired to slay her? in the hopes that her now-hated husband would get the blame, by the Russian secret police, by some random, unknown lunatic. Where was Lydia spending all that money? Who was Peroni? Who was the man named in the paper Lydia was waving about just before her death? Why was she so secretive about her father moving to the United States? Was he her father? If not, who was he? Who knows? 2. The Disappearance of Connie Converse Connie Converse was arguably the first modern singer-songwriter writing and playing intimate songs on her acoustic guitar in the mid-1950s. But she remained virtually unknown and disappeared in 1974. Now, her talent is finally being recognized. In summer 1974, days after her 50th birthday, Connie Converse sent fond letters to family and close friends telling them she wanted to make a fresh start. Disillusioned with how her life had turned out, she packed her possessions into her Volkswagen Beetle and left her Michigan home. She has not been seen since. Twenty years earlier, Connie Converse was living in Greenwich Village, the New York district where, in the mid-1950s, Beatniks and Bohemians were carving out counterculture. Converse was working for a printing firm, but had hopes of making it as a musician. In her apartment, she would write haunting beautiful songs with a poetic honesty and melodic sophistication that set her apart from the other singers in Greenwich Village. With the folk scene still dominated by political and traditional songs at that time, the concept of the solo acoustic singer-songwriter had barely moved beyond Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger's Dust Bowl balladry. Bob Dylan, Joan Baez and Joni Mitchell were still in school. Converse was not the most gifted vocalist or guitar player, and her voice had an air of formality that befitted the age. Yet when she sang, it was with a depth, intimacy and eloquence that were rare for that era. She sang of loneliness, of promiscuity, of quarreling lovers, of frequenting saloons in the afternoons. While some tunes had a jaunier, fireside air, most carried an underlying sense of sadness. Despite her ambitions, she did not play conventional gigs and stood on the edge of Greenwich Village's musical coterie. In 1954, she recorded a set of songs in the kitchen of Jean Deitch who had recorded Pete Seeger and John Lee Hooker in the 1940s. Deitch and her other friends tried to help her career, but to no avail. In 1961, the year Dylan moved to Greenwich Village, Converse turned her back on her music career and left New York for a job at the University of Michigan. Still unfulfilled, she fell into depression and heavy drinking. She would be 90 now. The more I thought about it, the songs were all about herself, says Deitch, now 90 who went on to become an Oscar-winning animator. I think that's what makes the songs interesting. No matter what she was singing, it all had to do with sexual frustration and loneliness. There's something about those songs that was extremely personal. In those days, this was something you never heard. Nowadays, there are lots of women singers who you might call folk singers or personal song singers, who are doing pretty much the same thing as Connie did. But I think she was really the first. It seemed that Converse's songs were destined to be forgotten until Deitch's recordings were put out as an album by a small New York label in 2009. Since then, the legend of Connie Converse has slowly grown. The music, considering when it was recorded, sounds eerily contemporary, says David Herman of Squirrel Thing Recordings which released the album How Sad, How Lovely. Her voice is really compelling. Add to that the fact this was a woman writing singer-songwriter style music in the mid-50s, before being a singer-songwriter was a thing, and before a female songwriter was something people were used to. And with the mystery of the disappearance, 
the whole thing leaves you with more questions than answers. The next step in her rediscovery comes on Wednesday when a 40-minute documentary by U.S. filmmaker Andrea Kahn receives its premiere at the Sensoria Film and Music Festival in Sheffield as part of a Connie Converse tribute night staged by British singer Nat Johnson. Kahn has had access to the filing cabinet Converse left behind, complete with her home recordings letters and journals. It's almost like she wanted it to be found and looked through, Khan says. What I found most fascinating was how funny she was in her writing. Here was a person who struggled through her whole life to feel successful, and you can tell there's a great sadness with a lot of the things she did and the way she lived her life, but she was also incredibly funny. You could tell that she was well liked and she had lots of friends. But there was still this wall between her and other people where it didn't seem like she 100% connected with anybody. As well as being frustrated in her music career, Converse had a powerful intellect that also never quite found its calling. A genius. At high school, she dominated the graduation prize-giving ceremony and won a prestigious college scholarship. But her parents were dismayed when she dropped out after two years and moved to New York, changing her name from Elizabeth and rejecting their strict teetotal. God-fearing upbringing. After giving up on music and leaving New York, Converse said it at the Journal of Conflict Resolution. She was also a keen political activist and a talented cartoonist. Her brother Phil, writing in 2000, described her as a genius and a polymath, adding, I do not use the terms lightly. She was also an enigma. The mystery of what became of her remains unsolved. Her family believes she took her own life probably by driving into a lake or river. But 60 years after she made those recordings in Greenwich Village, Connie Converse's voice is finally being heard. 3. The Murder of Neva Buchanan Her mother named the little girl Neva Heaven spelled backwards. Jennifer Buchanan says her daughter always was a little bit of heaven to her. Neva Buchanan was 5 when she was kidnapped on May 24, 2009. Her body was found in a shallow grave on June 4. A fisherman found Neva's body along the bank of the River Raisin near Monroe, Michigan, about 10 miles from the apartment she shared with her mother and grandmother. An autopsy showed the child died of asphyxiation. According to local news reports, she was most likely buried alive, though police will not formally confirm details. They did say, however, that a material similar to cement was found on top of her body. A year later, no one has been charged with abducting and killing Nevi. Her family is still waiting for answers. Last month, on the anniversary of the child's death, an organization called Justice for Nevi held a rally down the street from the apartment complex where she lived. The event included games and food for children as well as karate, self-defense classes and child safety presentations. Nevi was last seen the evening of May 24, playing in the U-turn driveway of her apartment complex. She wasn't supposed to be outside. Jennifer Buchanan said, she was supposed to be upstairs at a neighbor's playing with her friend at their place. Buchanan said she searched for Nev after another child tattled that she was playing outside. She recalled the cold fear that gripped her when she found her daughter's tricycle abandoned at the edge of the property. The sun was going down. It was almost 8 p.m. so I went looking for Nev, but we couldn't find her, said Buchanan, 25 who herself had recently been in trouble with the law. She had spent a few weeks in jail before being placed on probation in connection with a home invasion. I was in some trouble, but after I got out I focused on my daughter and getting my life back together, Buchanan said. Neva's official guardian was her grandmother, who lived in the apartment with them. Buchanan said police told her that Neva was not sexually assaulted and that no drugs were found in her system. Police would not discuss whether the child was sexually abused. But Detective Sergeant Heath Fillicott of the Monroe County Sheriff's Office said toxicology reports came back negative. Early in the investigation, police focused on two of Buchanan's friends. Both were convicted sex offenders. The men were arrested on parole violations and questioned extensively. Neither has been officially named a suspect. One of the men was living at a nearby motel and police searched his room but found no forensic evidence to connect him to the child's disappearance. Buchanan explained that she met one of the men while reporting to her probation officer. She said she had known him for two years and never left her daughter alone with him. Neva called him Daddy George, and he brought her toys and gifts, Buchanan added. She said she knew about his past rape case, adding, I believe people should get a second chance. Police have since shifted their focus away from the two sex offenders. We are looking in a different direction in recent months, based on our investigation, 
said Veliket. Investigators are looking at another Monroe resident, but Veliket would provide no further details. This is not a cold case, Veliket said. We are following up leads and investigating new information every day. Police say that while they are not naming any suspects or persons of interest, investigators have not ruled anyone out either. As of March 2016, the authorities are offering a reward of $50,000 to anybody who can provide the breakthrough tip they need to find and convict Neves killer. Break 4. The murder of David Widelick On the morning of September 20, 2010, a maintenance worker for the Community Central Bank in Mount Clemens, Michigan, found the empty car of company CEO David Widelick in the parking lot. Widelick wasn't anywhere in the building, either. So the worker called the police after finding Widelick's office in complete disarray. As it turned out, Widelick had not been seen since leaving work the previous night. According to security footage, he had left the building around 8 o'clock p.m. He was seen waiting at the door for 26 seconds and then walking out by himself. Although they acknowledged that Widelick might have disappeared voluntarily, the authorities declared him a missing person. By early October, there were still no signs of David Widelick. Investigators feared that the banker might have been the victim of foul play, for whatever reason, Widelick had bought a semi-automatic handgun several weeks before he went missing. Whether Widelick bought it for self-defense or because he felt suicidal has never been established. While he normally kept it in his office, the gun disappeared with him. After almost one month of searching, Widelick's decomposed body was found floating in a lake six kilometers, four miles, away from his bank. Noting that there were no signs of injuries on Widelick's body. The medical examiner concluded that Widelick had committed suicide. However, Widelick's family was skeptical and arranged a second autopsy. Amazingly, the first autopsy had missed a bullet that was found in Widelick's neck. He had been shot execution style in the back of the head, and investigators discovered his missing gun in the area where his body was found. Relatives accused the first coroner of a cover up but the coroner claimed that he had misread the X-ray results. Investigators have since reclassified Widelick's case as an unsolved homicide, but they have had few leads. Reportedly, Widelick was looking for new investors before his disappearance, leading some to suggest that his murder might have been connected to a potential business deal. Following weeks of investigation and a botched autopsy, then Macomb County Sheriff Mark Hackle told the public there was a strong possibility that Widelick killed himself but he did not rule out the possibility of foul play. Neither did Widelick's family. And so they hired former Wayne County homicide prosecutor Todd Flood to investigate Widelick's death on behalf of his estate. Several months later, Flood is preparing to present current Sheriff Tony Wickersham with his findings, which he says point towards homicide. Attorney says it's time to rule out suicide. One year after David Widelick first disappeared, his family continues to search for his killer. Disregarding speculation the banking executive died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Wylick was last seen on September 19, 2010, at Community Central Bank in Mount Clemens, which was struggling to stay afloat as he wooed potential investors. Roughly one month later, duck hunters discovered his decomposed body in the shallow waters of Lake Street. Claire, following weeks of investigation and a botched autopsy, then Macomb County Sheriff Mark Hackle told the public there was a strong possibility that Widelick killed himself, but he did not rule out the possibility of foul play. And so they hired former Wayne County homicide prosecutor Todd Flood to investigate Widelick's death on behalf of his estate. Several months later, Flood is preparing to present current Sheriff Tony Wickersham with his findings, which he says point towards homicide. We're working with them right now to give them our information. Flood told WJRAM 760 host Paul W. Smith on Monday morning. It could be the perfect murder, but murders don't happen in daylight. They don't happen in public. They happen in secluded dark spots where they don't want to get found. In a two-part series published Sunday in Today, the Detroit Free Press pointed out that several clues, emails, financial records, a nightstand memo and a washed-out note clutched in the dead man's hand, contradict the theory of suicide. The emails, Flood said, indicate that Widelook was planning a family vacation hours before his disappearance. The memo, found on a bedroom desk, suggests Widelook was concerned about someone who was not playing by the rules. Other evidence, such as security camera footage that shows Widelook pausing near the door for 26 seconds before leaving the bank, suggest he was waiting for a ride the night of his disappearance. But there is no smoking gun. There is no clear-cut suspect. We hope someday to get some final answers. Flood said. But until we come up with conclusions, 
this case is going to remain a mystery. 5. The murder of Chelsea Brock Chelsea Ellen Brock of Maybe was last seen walking with an unknown man at about 3 a.m. Sunday outside the party on Post Road in Frenchtown Township, the Monroe County Sheriff's Office reported, based on a witness statement. She was dressed as the Poison Ivy character from Batman, with black yoga pants, a leaf-covered top and a dark purple wig. Brock's family and friends are planning to expand a search today for clues to the missing young woman's whereabouts. Her sister, Cassandra Brock, 24, said this morning the family is encouraging people to share photos of Chelsea, even out of state. She could be anywhere at this point, she said. Helicopter and ground search teams with all-terrain vehicles continued to search areas in and around where the party was held on Post Road. About 30 people broke into two-person search parties in a five-mile radius of the house that hosted the party. And it has been three years since Chelsea Brock was last seen alive. After an agonizing search that lasted for months, her body was discovered. Chelsea was 22 years old when she vanished. What happened to Matt and Leanda Burke's youngest daughter is a mystery that haunts them to this day. This has been the most difficult year of our lives, said Leanda Brock, in her first sit-down interview since her daughter's body was found in April. On October 25, 2014, Brock was headed to a Halloween party on Post Road in Frenchtown Township. The party was heavily advertised on social media with more than 700 people attending. Brock was dressed as the villain Poison Ivy from Batman. Once there, witnesses say her ride to the party left, with Brock's cell phone and purse in the car. Brock never returned home. We thought she was going with friends and co-workers. We had no idea this party even existed, said Leanda. If we did, we would have done everything to discourage her from going. The events that followed turned into a nightmare for the Brock family. Days turned into weeks and still no sign of their daughter. The family set up a search party headquarters at an old Monroe Bank and Trust building in Newport. Hundreds of community members joined in the search. Nearly one million missing person posters were mailed across the country, and hundreds of purple ribbons, Brock's favorite color, hung throughout her hometown. Six months after she was last seen there was a break in the case. On April 5, someone found pieces of her costume in an abandoned industrial site in Flat Rock. Weeks later, the next discovery was the one the Brooks feared, human remains. They were found at a construction site in a wooded area near railroad tracks about 10 miles from where she was last seen alive. While the missing person posters have since been taken down, the search for her killer continues. The Monroe County Sheriff's Office released a sketch of the man they say was last seen with Brock. Investigators have yet to identify him. He may have some information for us. It doesn't mean he was the killer, but we would like to speak with him, said Brian Shroka, the lead detective in the case. Detectives say they have interviewed nearly 800 people and received more than 900 tips, but most people at the Halloween party were in costumes, making identification and investigating difficult. 6. Melon Heads The creatures, described as small humanoids with bulbous heads, occasionally emerge from their hiding places to attack people, it is said. The creatures are said to reside mainly near the ruins of Felt Mansion at Lake Town Township in Allegan County, but eyewitnesses have also reported seeing the humanoids in Holland and most southern woodland areas of Ottawa County. If they are real, where did they come from? But if they are only imagined, what started the legend? According to one story, the beings were originally children with hydrocephalus, or waterhead syndrome, who lived at the Junction Insane Asylum near Felt Mansion. The legend goes that after enduring physical and emotional abuse, they became feral mutants and were released into the forests surrounding when the asylum closed. Allegan County Historical Society has stated repeatedly that the Junction Insane Asylum never existed. However, the story has been part of the Ottawa County folklore for several decades. Lake Town Township manager Al Meshkin once told the Holland Sentinel newspaper that he had heard the tales as a teenager, noting that his friends referred to the beings as wobbleheads. One version of the legend claims children once lived in Felt Mansion itself, but later retreated to a system of underground caverns. The Dunes Correctional Facility once existed where the Junction Insane Asylum was said to be. The ruins of the old trustee building which once housed up to 80 inmates, is the last remaining structure on that side today. Some tales say the caverns the Melonheads found refuge in run from Allegan County to southwest Ottawa County, perhaps beneath Robinson Township. Another legend surrounding the origin of the creatures points to a man identified only as Dr. Crow, who studied hydrocephalus after World War II. Apparently, 
Crow created mutants with the idea of developing other species of humans using radiation. A paranormal novice relayed that Crow's plan was to breed monstrous creatures that hardly resembled human beings at all. He added that his experiments came to an end when the creatures rebelled and attacked him, ripping him apart and eating him. If you tend to believe the melon heads are of folklore only, then the legend goes back to the days of St. Augustine Seminary. Felt Mansion and its property became the street. Augustine Seminary for boys in 1949. The carriage house was used for classrooms, the mansion for housing, behind which they built a school. One of many who attended St. Augustine Seminary, now an investment manager from Grand Rapids, relate how the term melon heads originated. Some others who attended the seminary tell a similar story. Rumors start because of the unknown. The melon heads were actually seminarians at St. Augustine Seminary in the Felt Mansion, the former student explained. The local kids called us that because it was a private school and we were brainy. Apparently, public school children in the area thought students at St. Augustine to be arrogant, and privileged and would mockingly call them big-headed or melon heads. There was also some community resentment toward the seminary due to conflicting religious beliefs. The Catholic priests bought the property in 1949 for a seminary from the Felt family, the former student said. You could imagine how the Western Michigan Christian Reformed felt about that. Augustine Seminary added a few buildings to the property in the 1960s, but declining enrollment in the 1970s forced it to sell the land and buildings. The state of Michigan began using the property for a state police post and tore down the boys' school behind the mansion, and constructed the Dunes Correctional Facility. Today Felt Mansion is now on the National Register of Historic Places as well as the Michigan State Register of Historic Sites. Some still claim the melon heads are out there. But for doubters, the legend here can now begin to make some sense. 7. The John Doe of Plymouth Township Police in Plymouth Township have called the case their Mr. Bones. They are still wondering what happened to a man who was killed, wrapped in a carpet and dumped in a wooded area near railroad tracks. It's the township's only unsolved homicide, nearly two decades later, and police still don't know whose bones they were. We're hoping somebody will remember something, said Detective Charlie Rosam, with the township's police department. We're at a standstill. The bones were discovered on May 10, 1997. A man was surveying a wooded portion of Plymouth Township because he was thinking about buying some property nearby. He was walking near Haggerty Road, between Schoolcraft and Plymouth Roads, just north of the railroad tracks. That's when he spotted a mouse, or maybe a mole. He told police he decided, on a whim, to play with it, but the animal scurried inside a rolled up carpet. The man pulled back the brown carpet's corner and found a human skeleton still dressed in a blue and white striped shirt, blue shorts, and knee high socks that read USA 80, memorabilia from the 1980 Olympics. The carpet had been lying there for up to a decade, so long, in fact, that grass and weeds had grown through the rolled up carpet. According to police records, medical examiners determined that the man had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. A portion of his skull was bashed in. The case is fairly unusual for Plymouth Township. Rosam, one of the department's two detectives, can recall only one homicide in seven years. Here we have a guy that could have been laying in the field for five or ten years before he was found, and nobody knows who he is, said Rosam. We don't even have any place to start. For years, this was most of what was known about the victim, according to police records. He was probably white and stood between 5 feet 6 inches and 5 feet 9 inches. He was between 35 and 50 years old and had a build suggesting heavy labor or athletics. He was also in fairly poor medical condition. He had a non-standard surgical pin in his right upper arm, which could indicate a military field hospital. According to police records, his right hand and wrist had been fractured several times. He also appears to have suffered from Osgood-Schlatter disease, which causes knee pain. He appears to have worn dentures, and he wore a gold ring, which a jeweler later told Rosen was fake. For years, the case appeared stalled. DNA tests and attempts to recheck evidence have so far yielded no significant updates. But in late August of this year, Crime Stoppers put out a notice requesting clues. They got multiple tips about a homicide in West Bloomfield that took place in 1991, six years before the mystery bones were found. The case resulted in two convictions, but never led to the discovery of the body, said Kurt Lawson, deputy chief of the West Bloomfield Police Department. The victim in that case was Gustav Brilpak, 56, 
who worked the night shift as a welder at a GM plant about a mile from where the bones were found. A co-worker at that plant later told police that Prilpak served in the military at some point before working there. Prilpak was killed by members of his family, his stepson, Jan Boric, and Prilpak's wife, Jani Prilpak, 47, later told police that Gustav was controlling and would limit the amount of money that each could have per week. He also wanted the stepson out of the house, said Detective Sergeant David Street. Germain, also with West Bloomfield Police, a day or two before February 1, 1991, when the family reported Prilpak missing, he had gotten into a heated argument with his stepson in the driveway of their home on Field View in West Bloomfield. Then there was another altercation inside the home. Lawson said. This one turned physical, Prilpak drew a small knife and told Boric, 22, that he had to leave. Boric grabbed a fire poker and bashed his stepfather on the head, then took the knife from him and slashed him in the neck, Lawson said. Boric would later tell police that he acted in self-defense. But Boric, along with his mother, then wrapped the body up in linoleum, or maybe carpet, Jania Prilpak told two different stories and dumped it somewhere else. When police later examined their home, there was a section of carpet that, in a photo, looked similar to the carpet that the mystery victim was found in. According to Rosam, the detective with Plymouth Township Police, Prilpak's wife and stepson later confessed. His stepson was convicted of second-degree murder, and his wife was convicted of an accessory charge. Both served prison terms and were then deported, possibly back to Czechoslovakia, where they were both from. Lawson said, but the whereabouts of Gustav Prilpak's body remained a mystery. No other family members are still in the country to be interviewed. But even with all these similarities, the case was known to investigators and dismissed at the time as unlikely. The biggest difference is in the teeth. The man found in the carpet had lost most of his teeth and appeared to wear dentures. But Prilpak was thought to still have teeth a year before he died. Police interviewed his dentist, and even if he had lost them in the span of just one year, when the dentist had last seen him, the sockets would have needed more time to heal before the death, an expert concluded at the time. The cases have another key difference, the man in the carpet had shorts that measured 30 inches at the waist, while pants thought to belong to Prilpak, and taken from his garbage measured 38 inches. According to police records, these differences were enough to effectively eliminate the possibility that the mystery bones were those of Prilpak. Still, within the last few months, Police are trying to match blood samples, from the Prilpak crime scene with DNA from a bone in Plymouth Township. These tests would not have been possible at the time. We're going to use the capability we have now to try to determine who this person is, Lawson said. The results will likely take weeks, maybe a couple months. If a connection can't be established, it's not clear what's next. We're kind of hoping that it matches, Rosam said. We're kind of 8. The murder of Donald Goines and Shirley Saylor. Donald Goines was born in 1938, to a prominent middle-class Detroit family. In spite of the fact that most of black Detroit was struggling and poor, the Goines family ran a laundry business and was rather successful and the children attended Catholic school. However, Donald was bullied throughout his most of adolescence for being extremely fair-skinned and skinny. This led him to start hanging out with a rougher crowd and sometime during his freshman year he dropped out of school. It was what he did next that led to him becoming such a prominent writer, and led to his murder many years later. He joined the Air Force. At only 15 and a high school dropout, he falsified documents and was sent off to fight in the Korean War. While in Japan and mainland Korea, he developed a taste for prostitutes and heroin. He received an honorable discharge in a terrible addiction. He wasted no time once he was out of the Air Force and he to feed his habit, he quickly turned to stealing and pimping. He was incarcerated several times and it was during one of these, that his mother brought him a typewriter. He sent the first draft of what would become one of his most famous novels to Holloway House. While still in prison and when he was released in 1970, his first book was published. Holloway House paid writers on contract on a per book basis. Wanting to make money through illegal means and wanting to get high, by the time of his murder in 1974, he had written 16 books. It is believed these books had something to do with his murder. On October 4, 1974, Donald Goines and his common-law wife Shirley Saylor were shot and killed in their Detroit home. He was found in the living room of the house, and most retellings of the murder say that he was shot while at his typewriter. Saylor was fatally wounded in the kitchen, and two of their children were found unharmed in another room of the house. There are two prominent theories about his death. 
though no one has ever been charged. The first is that he owed someone a drug debt and they sent contract killers after him, while the other is that the people who he based his characters on were unhappy, and afraid of the attention they were getting. When he was buried, his mother placed several of his books inside of his coffin. Obviously, the two most popular theories do seem like the most likely. But if they were contract killers why did they only kill two people in the house? Did they knowingly spare the children or not know they were there? Did Staler just get caught in the middle or was the contract for her too? If it was related to the gang members and criminals he was writing about, don't you think they would have made sure everyone was dead before leaving? Even the kids, from what I read, Sailor was only wounded, fatally sure, but that leaves me to believe she was alive when they found her. Mostly, I wonder why they never did find out any more about the murder. Considering Goyne's prominence, you would think someone would have talked. Do you think racial attitudes had something to do with this never getting solved? This case will probably never be officially solved, especially after all of these years, but it's definitely a case that's interesting and one that shouldn't be forgotten. Also. I apologize. I tried to keep this short but I kind of failed. Goins is just an interesting man. The story sucks you in. 9. The March 1966 UFO Wave In 1966, a string of seemingly odd occurrences in Washtenaw County drew the attention of the entire country. The events centered on a sudden wave of UFO sightings, with reports by police and citizens in March 1966. It began on March 14, 1966 when Washtenaw County officers spotted lights in the sky, moving at high speeds over Lima Township. The same lights were spotted by officers in Ohio, just across the Michigan border, and by observers at Selfridge Air Force Base. The sightings triggered investigations by the Civil Defense and U.S. Air Force. A few days following the first reports, the lights were spotted again at various locations around Washtenaw County, with one deputy reporting something floating in the sky described as looking like a child's top. On Sunday, March 20, 1966, the Sheriff's Office received reports of a UFO landing in a wooded, swamp area of Dexter Township. Police spoke to Frank Manor, a truck driver who had gone into the swamp with his son. Here's what Manor told police, We got to about 500 yards of the thing, Manor told interviewers, It was sort of shaped like a pyramid, with a blue-green light on the right-hand side and on the left. A white light. I didn't see no antenna or porthole. The body was like a yellowish coral rock and looked like it had holes in it, sort of like if you took a piece of cardboard box and split it open. You couldn't see it too good because it was surrounded with heat waves, like you see on the desert. The white light turned to a blood red as we got close to it and Ron said, look at that horrible thing. Here's the report from the NACAP, Frank Manor and his son, Ronald, plus 40-60 others including 12 policemen saw hovering over a swamp about 1,500 feet away a brown luminous car-sized object, with a scaly or waffled surface, cone-shaped on top, flat on bottom, or football-shaped, and two bluish-green lights on right and left edges that turned bright red and helped illuminate object in between. Lights blinked out and object reappeared instantly across the swamp 1,500 feet away. The whole object lit up with a yellowish glow at one point and also rose up 500 feet then descended again. After 2-3 minutes of viewing, when two flashlights appeared in the distance the object seemed to respond by flying away at high speed directly over the witnesses with a whistling sound like a rifle bullet ricocheting. Object remained in the swamp area for one half hour. The report gained national attention. More than 40 officers joined a search of the swamp. Odd sightings continued, with officers spotting red and white lights in the sky, flying back and forth and then disappearing. The next night, more than 80 students at Hillsdale College reported seeing lights in a nearby swamp. The UFO craze took over, and reports from all around the Ann Arbor area, as well as surrounding areas in Michigan, started pouring in. Michigan Congressman Weston Vivian requested that the U.S. Air Force send an investigator from Project Blue Book, the agency that studied UFOs. Dr. J. Alan Hynek, an astronomer from Northwestern, was tasked with the investigation. Hynek arrived on March 23, touring the areas of sightings himself. What he found was something he called near hysteria. It's like reports from people who witness a fire. Heinick told the press at the time, You get as many different facts as you get people who saw the fire. So far, all I've been able to come up with is reports of a variety of lights. Under pressure for an explanation, Heinick told reporters during a press conference on March 25 that the sightings were simply mistaken observations of the moon and stars, 
and the Dexter UFO was just swamp gas. The swamp gas theory didn't go over so well. Many thought it was a huge cover-up. Several publications accused the government of hiding evidence. Here was the actual explanation from Project Blue Book. A swamp is a place of rotting vegetation and decomposition. Swamps are not a province of astronomers. Yet, the famous Dutch astronomer, Ninert, in his book, Light and Color in the Open Air, describes lights that have been seen in swamps by the astronomer Bessel and other excellent observers. The lights resemble tiny flames sometimes seen right on the ground and sometimes rising and floating above it. The flames go out in one place and suddenly appear in another, giving the illusion of motion. The colors are sometimes yellow, sometimes red, and sometimes blue-green. No heat is felt, and the lights do not burn or char the ground. They can appear for hours at a stretch and sometimes for a whole night. Generally, there is no smell and no sound except for the popping sound of little explosions such as when a gas burner ignites. Congressman, and future president, Gerald Ford called for a congressional investigation. During all of this, UFO sightings continued pouring in from all over Michigan, and around the country. By April 1966, the UFO frenzy had died down in Michigan, but the swamp gas explanation is still talked about to this day. Thirty years later, Douglas Harvey, Washtenaw County Sheriff at the time of the original sightings told the Ann Arbor News he and Dr. Heinrich were talking in the sheriff's office and the scientist admitted he didn't know what the witnesses had seen, but felt it was worthy of further investigation. He was on the phone for quite a while, which I found very enlightening, Harvey said. He came out and I said, well, Dr. Heinrich, what do you think? He said, it's swamp gas. He tells me one minute he has no idea what it is. And then he makes one phone call to Washington and comes out and gives a statement that it's swamp gas. Very strange. They did see something, he said. I'll believe this to the day I die. Somebody has kept something quiet, and nothing more ever materialized. So we don't know if it was the government experimenting, or was it really a UFO? I don't know. Although the causes of most of those UFO sightings might have been earthly in origin, Soil samples from the area where the Manans had spotted their UFO showed radiation levels that were higher than normal. These results, which also found high levels of radiation in the water, have never been explained. <laughs>